I spoke with Lisa recently and uh, she said I should introduce some of my background. Um, and I suppose the first thing that came to mind was that I should celebrate 50 years in uh, the construction civil engineering industry. So um, uh, my background goes back to uh, when I started off in Papua New Guinea, Bougainville Copper, uh, Surinamu Dam, and then back into Australia on uh, uh, Tallawa Dam down in New South Wales, uh, Shoalhaven and the Kangaroo River. And then uh, off to the Thames Barrier in London, uh, back to Australia, um, Coomba Bar Series Treatment Works, and then down to, uh, oh, that's right, up to Abbott Point in the coal loading facility, uh, down to Melbourne. I've been in Melbourne for X number of years and uh, constructed my or been involved with most of the freeways around town, uh, Blackrock Sewerage Treatment Plant down at Geelong. I bid and won that twice. Um, contractual claims, and so now I'm consulting and uh, been spending the last three years uh, at Level Crossing Removal Authority, putting things into practice there. So uh, we'll kick this off. So uncovering the unknown knowns. Uh, what is an unknown known? It's something known by one of the stakeholders but overlooked by the project team. So the requirement is that the project team spend time and energy understanding what this stakeholder, the language of the stakeholder and extracting a risk from that and putting risk treatments into action. And so we talk about the engineering failures um, that, um, that have occurred. Uh, and I'll give you some examples of fatalities and uh, major failures. And then I investigate what could have been done to eliminate, reduce those sort of risks. And uh, my analysis and research has shown me that uh, by investing in treatment solutions, you save uh, 17 times well, or the cost of events if they occur are 17 times more than the cost of a treatment solution. So today's outline, where the risks most occur, and I have my favourite acronym DERUPTO to describe where those risks are on major civil projects. And then we talk about the tools, methods and processes to investigate, test and probe the future. So I'll give you um, about five tools, five methods, five processes, and I'll bounce around between projects that I've worked on and what these tools are. And then we look at the uh, leadership and the work managers need to do to ensure that the risk treatment process is undertaken. Uh, so I talk about Donald Rumsfeld. He, uh, he of course came up with the known knowns, the known unknowns and the unknown known, unknowns. And uh, I've come up with the unknown known. <laughs> And I told you that's the issue named by some of the stakeholders but overlooked by the project group. So I've then got a chart here where risk types, risk types to project budget. So here's your risk types, known, unknown, unknown knowns in yellow and the unknown knowns. And here's the level of control. You can get full control, some control. You can get some control if you make the effort and no control. Can you see that? that uh, uh, can you see that? Um, no, you can't, can you? All right, so I've got to use this thing um, down here. And then over here, this is the project budget. And you've got a basic cost, which uh, includes some of the work that you can do by investigating models, trials, and prototypes. Uh, here's the contingencies. There's the inherent contingency due to uh, quantities and rates of production, uh, the contingent risk for events, and up here I put the systemic risks. And uh, these are 
risks that are a nature of the organisation, the culture of the organisation, and they're made in uh, four major areas. Scope definition is the first, team development, new technology and project controls. And um, uh, so here is the systemic risks and uh, systemic risks have been introduced to me by John Holman. Uh, how many of you know John Holman? Just put your hand up. And of course he has written a book about uh, project risk quantification. He is, in my opinion, the guru in cost engineering. And uh, so he's opened my eyes to systemic risks that occur on projects due to the culture of the organisation running them. And then on top of that you have the project specific risks. So in uh, scope definition, the first one, my uh, recommendation is to use the Construction Industry Institute's Project Definition Rating Index. And uh, it's a tool that separates uh, into three sections, uh, 11 categories and 68 elements that are questions and prompts to get you to look at the scope definition, that's a lot to do with the drawings and the specifications of a project and be able to assess where it is. It's a, um, a method of uh, a thousand point system and uh, it's recommended that you try and get that down to 250 to 300 points. How many of you are familiar with the Construction Industry Institute? And uh, one, two, and uh, so you may be familiar. Um, so the next one's team development. Uh, John Holman has uh, said that that's the second most important and uh, uh, first of a kind, FOAC, I like that. That's uh, Tim Rigby's out of Bechtel um, acronym, Project Controls. And the likelihood of occurrence of systemic risks is 100%. So that's what distinguishes it from the project specific risks which have a likelihood less than 100%. So here he is, John Holman. I invited John to Melbourne he, in uh, June last year and he gave us the three-day course in Melbourne on project risk quantification. And uh, here he is uh, at that um, seminar. Uh, Peter Rautenberg just told me that uh, he's got John Holman down for BHP in, uh, in Brisbane recently to run his parametric model. This is John's book, Project Risk Quantifications, and uh, here's Janus, his uh, symbol, looking to the future and looking back at the past, which is good for risk management. Here is John's model, and uh, I'll point out with the pointer here because I don't think I can point on this. I'll have another try. Is that coming out? No, it's not. So I've got to use this point. So the first uh, parts of John Holman's parametric model. You see here it's a case example for a parametric model for cost growth. He has another one for schedule slip. So with the systemic risk for cost growth, uh, the scope definition is a key component. You can see it's quite a large factor there. New technology, process severity, complexity, and then down the bottom here he's got the team development, project controls, uh, other, other things there, bias, so on. The ones I've given you there are basically what it is. Here's one that we did recently or last year on uh, Novel Crossing Remedial, McKinnon and Centre Road. We did this retrospectively and you can see here we ended up with a, a, a project um, uh, definition rating index of 317 out of 1,000. So that would be in a position where Treasury and Finance would be happy with uh, the project going ahead with the scope being defined at about that level. So uh, the, here's the, the first letter of each of these is my acronym DERUPTO and where uh, it was developed when I worked on Eastlink and the value of the variations and claims that I was preparing were in that order. 
So design was the most important and the most expensive access approvals. I've now added availability. Real cutting utility services, unsuitable conditions, procurement, traffic management, out of sequence work. So that's the derupto. And we're using that in the benchmarking proposals that we, we look at at the moment. Uh, so, and what I've found uh, rec more recently through the John Holman is that the design, and from a contactor's point of view, which is my background, design was always the big issue. The designer changed and there was a variation. But behind the design was the scope definition. So that's why I've introduced that systemic risk defining scope defi definition, which John Holman says is 67% of the, of the systemic risk. That's what you need to get right going ahead and that stops the design changes. So there's some examples here. Um, collapse of the Westgate Bridge, the Baldy Bridge spalling concrete into Yarra River, uh, Murramurran valves and uh, the first of a kind sky rail. I'll just make some comments on that. So here's the Westgate Bridge and uh, you may know that between piers 10 and 11 uh, it was a simply supported D shape but it was erected in two halves with a longitudinal stitch. And what the late Paul Grundy from Monash University found is that when you have a D shape, it deflects uniformly under its own weight. But if you have half a D, it's an H shape and the H rotates outwards. So they were able to connect the bottom stitch paw of the steel box girder, but the top they couldn't, they had to try and pull it across. And in doing that, it buckled. They also found that it was under-designed and the Royal Commission into the collapse of the Westgate Bridge where 35 lives were lost, uh, indicated that Freeman Fox, the UK designer, was, I'll use the word, arrogant in not assisting the contractor to understand the, uh, the stresses involved with the temporary works so uh, it's split down there and uh, right in the middle. And uh, so here I come up with a model. How can we show that this would have happened? So uh, it's just from Bunnings, a couple of uh, aluminium angles, put it together on a bench. And then I push down with my thumb, take a photograph, and you can see it's rotating at the top. So my theory is you can use models to show what could happen simple models, they don't, not expensive, and uh, so that's where it's split there. Now the next one was the Baldy Bridge, um, I was with Balderstone on that, and uh, just near the end of the job, we were trying to, um, we're, we're about to stress the post-tensioning cables, and because the stressing ducts were out of tolerance. They were supposed to be plus or minus five millimetres. In the event, they were plus 28 millimetres. And so when the load, 10,000 tonne load of post-tensioning went on, concrete spalled from the bottom of that suffit there down into the Yarra. No fatalities, no uh, loss of life or anything. But we had to go back and repair the um, the uh, the suffit by uh, adding steel straps, galvanised steel straps on the underside of the suffit at the centre of the bridge there, both spans. My theory is that the designers should consult with the contractors and advise them where their maximum stresses are. And the contractor should ask the question, what if you increase that by 50%? What, what effect that would have? Well, they said, well, geez, you'd have to make sure those ducts are right. Because these ducts were surrounded by 36 mil rebar, very tightly packed, and, uh, and it was difficult for the contractor to get the ducts in the correct position. Here's another one, and it's, uh, this is Murrin Murrin Nickel at Leonora, and there was a failure 
from t uh, after start up 24 hours in the first 24 hours they had valves failing 600 mil diameter valves failing on initial start up it was a 1 billion dollar job that went to 1.6 billion dollars so a huge failure as commercially what I, the, the point there is they should have put that the high stresses and temperatures acid uh, pressure should have modelled it in a in a small laboratory, rather than wait till the the initial start up to find that the valves were inadequate. Today, Murrin Murrin is a profitable organisation uh, delivering thirty thousand tonnes per annum of nickel, and uh, but they could have been more profitable if they'd done the right thing earlier. Now we're into uh, level crossing removal. This is at Kurnang Road and um, Skyrail. The issue here was for the first time we were constructing over live rail right next door. So you can see there's a car going across the crossing, but the, the overhead line equipment is in place and the trains are running there. And here the straddle carrier uh, and support beam is shown there. The straddle carrier brings in a 420 ton span and places it in position and it's right next to live rail. So what happened at the start was they, they didn't understand the, uh, well this is MTM, uh, or there was, a, there, was a, there was not only a change that it was first of a kind to do work adjacent to live rail. The other thing was that the regulator changed. So the National Rail Regulator took control of the systems safety assurance system. And uh, that required MTM to satisfy conditions that they weren't used to, compared with the PTV safety regulator. And uh, so they were, they, they had to take extra time to go through the whole design process and prove that it wouldn't upset live rail traffic. Otherwise there'd be huge liquidated damages and so on if it disrupted the, the rail line. So it was first of a kind technology and, and operation doing work near live rail and the regulator change. So it delayed the, the project by about three months and uh, added tens of millions of dollars. So access and approval tools, um, my recommendation is to engage a diverse range of stakeholders. Don't use the same crew, always bring in people that don't really know much about the project and they'll come up with little suggestions and ideas that, oh, didn't think about that and you can deal with them. Uh, click over one there, yeah, access and approval, yeah. So um, utility services, um, so we're just going through these derupto events here uh, I'm going to talk about the Solnar disasters, the, the fibre optic cable punctured at Turak Road underpass. So you know they're drilling through to support the uh, batter support and hit the fibre optic cable. Uh, down on Coonan's Road on Tulla we um, you know, were drilling through the same thing, more shot creep supporting the batters, uh, puncture the sewer and the blokes filled it up with, with cement grout and kept on pumping grout. Hey, what's going on? All this grout going in. Uh, near miss survey picket, survey, steel survey picket put in in the ground near Flemington Bridge, right next to 2,200 uh, volt uh, cable. Hey, you reckon the sparks were flying there? Unsuitable conditions. So um, here was a case on uh, the Hume Freeway at Benalla. The, and this is, uh, there's two cases here. One, it was part of the Bicentennial Road Scheme, so there was pressure on Vic Roads at the time to uh, spend the money. And so very small geotechnical research was done. They took a post hole digger and uh, drilled down 750 mil every 400 metres, came to the conclusion there was 250 mil of uh, silt to take off and then get in and build the job. Well here you can see we're down uh, three and a half metres uh, digging out unsuitable and stable material. Uh, 
big delay, big claim yeah, procurement. And so here's uh, Western Link uh, with Boulderstone and the underslung trusses. So there's a, a, the uh, upstream um, or up north northbound uh, carriageway with two underslung trusses and the southbound carriageway each with two underslung trusses. These trusses are uh, 100 metres long. Uh, I've put this in procurement because uh, in the, and of course this is around Spion Cop in the Mooney Ponds Creek there. Uh, the procurement here was by, I think it was Life Ease in uh, New South Wales, did the welding. When it came to site, welds are undersized, incomplete, had to go through and re-weld, re-proof re uh, and it was a six week delay at the start of the elevated road. So here we've got some investigative tools and uh, I talk about a, the divergent convergent thinking model which is my rapid risk model for risk management workshops. Uh, the diverse range of stakeholders, we talked about that. Review the lessons learned and interview people. Lessons learned, st stuck in a book on a shelf somewhere, don't really add much. If you can get to the people who wrote it and have a face-to-face -face interview, you'll get the really key points there. Use the techniques of De Bono and Rumsfeld. I love De Bono, um, using his six thinking hats, six action shoes, six value medals, and uh, more recently I've been using his six frames for looking at information. Rumsfeld, I talked about that, and John Holman's parametric model to evaluate systemic risks, which I've shown you before. So here is the the um, rapid risk model for the risk management workshops. There's two parts, and the analysis and treatment. And my view is that we spend too much time on analysis. I don't think it's important or as important. A quick, rough analysis is good, and to spend the time on treatment and making sure the treatment works. This is what makes risk management work. So I, I force people to be quite um, uh, to follow these these procedures, it's a bit like um, yeah, uh, De Bono's uh, six action shoes. It's the purple shoes. Follow the procedure, no matter what. And uh, so every risk has to be an event plus a consequence. These generalised risks that oh, there's going to be failures or there's going to be you know it's going to be unhealthy. That is not acceptable. It has to be a risk, an event plus a consequence. When you put it in this way, it's easy to treat. And uh, you need to have your stakeholders, that's the people who are going to be treating the risks involved in the workshops, so they understand the reason why and they can execute it later on. So we do, everything's got to be a what if, so it's got to be a what if noun verb, what if man falls from bridge. And then we rate that for likelihood of occurrence, severity of consequence, and give it a risk level. And then we rate that by Excel to get the risk register. And then we go into the next phase of divergent thinking, which is can we and we develop the treatment solutions. So the divergent thinking is always a lot of fun. The convergent thinking, the rating, is hard work. But in the fun stage, if you can get a bit of laughter, then that oils the wheels and you often get good risks and good treatments following a good old belly laugh. And so it's a can we verb noun, it always must be verb noun. Uh, can we erect fence, can we um, whatever. And what we're trying to do is eliminate, reduce, transfer or carry. So I'd like to all stand up and we'll just do this. Uh, we eliminate, we Transfer, we, we reduce, we transfer, or we carry the residual, residual risk. Have a bit of exercise. Stand up. How do we treat risks? We eliminate, we reduce, we transfer, that's a handball, or we carry the residual risk. And what do we do for um, opportunities? We seize, we increase, we share, or we carry the, we manage the opportunities. Go up, sit down, well done. <laughs> Got to have a bit of exercise. Uh, so that's the treatment solutions. And then the convergent 
uh, thinking, adopt immediately, discuss, discuss if we've got time or discard. And then we get the action list. So it's action by a responsible person and a date by when. And that's where the leadership comes in, making sure they are complied with. So thinking and action tools, de bonos. So some of the de bonos, like the red hat, uh, is for emotions. And uh, you know, you're allowed to say, well, I think the project manager is a dickhead. That is acceptable um, uh, red hat thinking. It's emotional. It creates a few laughs. And you, know, you can get some good ideas from that. The grey sneakers sniff around and get the information. The brown brogues roll up the sleeves, do the hard work. And the value medals are a very good way for assessing treatment solutions. So that's the six medals and uh, you can assess in a plus three to minus three um, rating for things like profit. So some, some uh, a treatment solution may be good for the profit, but it might be poor for the people and it might be poor on the environment. So you can assess your treatment solutions by using De Bono's six action medals, six value medals. And Rumsfeld, because he, he's uh, famous for saying, what else? You know, so when you're out in the field and you, you can see the, um, the water, water main, have a look else. There might be an electric cable there and there might be overheads. And what's missing? He says that uh, only 4% of the people can tell you what's missing. A lot of people can say, they can look at a report and say, what else? But what's missing is, uh, separates those. Now, the sabotage phase is what I use with mature workshop groups to brainstorm how they can stuff up a project. And then we use problem reversal to get some good treatment solutions we can find that uh, uh, people can develop a lot more ways to stuff up a project and so you can get some good treatments there. So we're going to practical methods and I'm very much a, uh, a fan of scale models. Uh, testing functions with simple tests, we'll talk about that. Engage hands-on experienced people to train. Uh, intensify quality assurance. Preemptive mitigation plans and resources. I was quite impressed recently with Steve Littrick on Southern Program Alliance. He said he not only had Plan A, he had Plan B and Plan C. I've never heard of that before. Plan C. So here we are on uh, on Western Link again, and we created a one in a hundred scale model of that hundred metre long uh, underslung trusses. So uh, it was a metre long and the foreman, superintendent and engineers could all practice moving the trusses along on and erecting the pier brackets that supported them and being able to drive the underslung trusses around different radii. So it was an excellent learning practical tool that we used. Next one was Mooney Ponds Creek. We had a model there with the 39 sticks in the river and we, uh, we changed from blade piers to circular piers because there was less afflux upstream. Here's a model I created in, uh, when I did the independent estimate for Greenvale Dam. Uh, Tease eventually with a contractor on site. Um, we had to remove material from the downstream face of the dam because they didn't have a chimney filter on the downstream side or in the dam, on the main dam embankment. So here's a dam with a huge population at risk downstream and so we're, the, we're very vulnerable on, until this upgrade was made. So in this scale model I was able to develop or, or establish that I didn't have room for the trucks and the excavators to actually dig the trench for the, for the filter sand and so we had to actually place more material on the downstream face to enable trucks and vehicles to work there. And uh, so it was set up with different reduced levels and so on, so it was a very handy tool. Now some of the digital engineering, here's Langer Rock uh, with a rail job, and the key thing here is the yellow crane on the far side there, and what we're looking at is tail radius, what does that clash with, and where does the boom go 
And is the boom hitting any permanent works in the foreground? We had a case, uh, the beam and sticks, when we erected that final bit of the yellow beam, the crane was set up so that it would clash with the with the uh, with that last piece of yellow beam going up there, it was going to clash with the jib of the crane, and we had to cancel that lift and it rework it. Cost thousands of dollars. Um, project engineer needed a good smack on the hand over that. Now, so with the digital modelling, uh, I'm not I'm not an expert at it. I haven't used it myself. Uh, I think it's a good idea. But I like the practical side of the models. And I think the benefit is to the person who's using the model. So it's a physical model, or if you can do a digital model yourself, that's where you get the benefit. I don't think there's a lot of benefit in just looking at what some computer boffin has developed and uh, you know, being an observer. So uh, at level crossing, uh, John Dyer has given me some sketches here. So we've got Mentone Station, uh, Structural Envelope, and he's using the digital engineering models to uh, look at design options. And so here he's dropped in the St Albans Station. Here he, uh, St Albans Option, another option. Uh, he's still on Mentone Station with Jennifer comparison. Now he goes to Cheltenham Station. He's got his Structural Envelope. You can see it going over Charman Road there. Park is just behind us, and uh, so he's putting in the concourse, uh, putting in the rail, and building. He's got a Bentley option, he's got a McKinnon option, and he's got an Ormond option. So good for concepts. They were looking at the um, the cemetery just to the right-hand side of the rail station there, and what was overlapping on that so it was a good design way of looking at design options none of those were accepted finally um, I think they've got something slightly different but it was good uh, engineering value engineering so here we are at Yarwin Tailings Dam and the uh, the point here was the filter sand was uh, right on the limit of the space and here is a simple test uh, doing permeability tests in filter sand. Has anyone done that? It takes forever. It goes up and down from Brisbane to Melbourne and no one seems to get an answer for any time. Uh, so here, just doing a simple test, digging a hole in the filter sand, filling it up with a bucket of water and measuring how quickly it, it goes down. Now in the event, uh, the requirement was for no more than 4% passing the 0.075 sieve and, um, and in the case, uh, this case, it did, it was, was more. We we'll tap that, here we go. Um, and so we had 5,000 cubic metres of filter sand placed there with the downstream fill right next to it and it all had to come out and be done again. And you're importing sand, filter sand from 200 kilometres away you're trying to compact it to 70% uh, uh, standard density for sand and uh, very expensive. And the next one is uh, using, so this is Eage, Colorado. I went over there and uh, got, this is for the um, Optus Fibre Optic Cable project. Uh, bought the uh, Braun HS2 plough to plough in the fibre optic cable, but we brought back the superintendent that was running this crew and uh, he trained up all our crew on uh, how to run the dozers and how to plough the uh, fibre cable in. That was uh, Sydney, Melbourne, uh, Sydney, Brisbane and so on. Some project processes. Uh, the theory here is to vigorously investigate early warning signs. Reward in issue identification. Define the standards on a project early and repeat. Use the Construction Industry Institute Disputes Potential Index. I told you about the Construction Industry Institute's Project Definition Rating Index. So this is another one. Uh, they're out of uh, Austin, Texas in the USA. 
and uh, the disputes potential index allows you to assess the strengths and weaknesses of the project teams, both from the client, the owner's side and the contractor's side. Uh, use dispute resolution boards, are very popular in New South Wales, are very effective in, in managing projects. So here's the I-35 West Bridge in Minneapolis, USA, 1st of August 2007. I think there was uh, 14 fatalities and uh, 145 um, uh, people injured. Sorry, 13 fatalities and 145 injured. And uh, the, uh, yes, terrible, terrible thing. But four years prior to the event, in their inspection, they found that the gusset plates here had bowed, but no action were taken. It was only after the collapse that the engineer established that the, the thickness of the gusset plates were half what they were expected to be. And of course, it didn't help that they had 262 tonnes of equipment, uh, materials for repairing the road and so on on site at the time, just directly above the, the point of collapse. And it didn't help that there was the cost creep, or sorry, risk creep, of having a 50 mil concrete overlay over the deck, adding to the, the, the uh, dead load. SO Longford, um, 25th of September, 1998, killed two, injured eight workers. Now do you remember the cold showers in Melbourne for two weeks when that occurred? Well you may not realise or may not have remembered that two, uh, no, four weeks prior to that there was, um, yeah four weeks prior there was a similar event where it uh, shut down the, um, uh, the supply of gas to Melbourne. And so it was, now what happened there was the, uh, the heat exchanger GP905 uh, had a pump failure. It was at about minus 48 degrees. Uh, they repaired the pump and they put in hot oil at 230 degrees centigrade. Uh, it caused the tank to swell, uh, split, release of hydrocarbons, uh, ignition, explosion, and the two fatalities, and, um, and eight workers uh, injured. Next one's uh, Malahide Bridge in Ireland, and just north of Dublin, and uh, Pier 4 collapsed just after the train went across, a six o'clock in the evening train went across, the train driver could see the pier collapsing, he drove the train slowly, it got across, no one was injured. And the original design, it's sort of strange, it's a rock fill weir on which piers are constructed and then the superstructure. The original design had a hydraulic jump 20 metres to the east. There is an outflow of 400 cumex, cubic, cubic metres a second, and if that's evenly distributed across the whole of the weir, everything's okay. But in the event, uh, the rocks started to erode around Pier 4 and uh, uh, dragged material away. Here's a photograph of the erosion showing this had moved to the upstream side on an outgoing tide. Here's the local scout leader who's paddling around this, there was Broad Meadows area, that's what it was called, uh, and he was familiar with it and he uh, rang up Irish Rail and said, hey, there's some rocks coming out of this Pier 4. Um, so they sent a a crew out there and they would have gone up the top of the rail, looked, looked at everything. I don't know if they went at a, 
outgoing tide, ingoing tide, but uh, they, they obviously didn't have a hydraulics engineer there to assess what could have happened or what could be going on. So the importance of engaging with a diverse range of stakeholders to get all of the ideas. Um, so and here is the, f some details of the project definition rating index. I've told you that I've been made aware of this with John Holman's systemic risk calculations and uh, so here are the 11 categories of, in the three sections and behind every one of those 11 categories is a total of 68 questions that allows you to inter interrogate the maturity of your scope of the project and, give, and it gives a, a 1,000 point rating. So your objective is to rate that. If you're around about the 250 to 300, good to go ahead. Treasury and Finance will be happy with that. If you've got a rating of, say, 500 or 510, it then gives you the areas where you need to do more work. So it's, it, it allows you to communicate to others a numerical value of the maturity of your scope of work but it also allows you to do something immediately on the areas where you're weak. And it talked about the disputes potential index. So this is the, uh, the items that it uh, allows you to assess, typically the people and the processes of uh, the project that you go ahead on. So and disputes resolution boards, as I said, in New South Wales. And the key thing there is that the experienced people on the Dis Dispute Resolution Board are able to identify and inform the two parties of the issue and allow them to get together and sort out the problem. That's the beauty of the system. An excellent track record. I, I don't think there has been any disputes where they've had a Dispute Resolution Board. And so lastly, we come to leadership in risk management. And uh, there are the four uh, aspects that uh, in leaders need to follow. Uh, making decisions, so it's important to define, for the leaders to define their risk tolerance and to, uh, to determine in their opinion what is catastrophic for their organisation, so a contractor a small contractor might say, hey, uh, half a million dollars is catastrophic. If you've got a BHP, it's $10 million. And so each organisation satisfies what's catastrophic in their view. Uh, a number of contractors say a week's delay is catastrophic. They, don't, they hate delays, so they'll make any time delay uh, an important risk that they have to treat. Uh, investing in thorough investigation models and trials. I'll talk with you about that. Selecting and developing people. So that they want to identify people that can uh, use the words uh, involved with risk management. So it's uh, likelihood of occurrence, severity of consequence, level of risk. It's a three-dimensional model. Uh, communicate. Uh, so it's important that the risk treaters, the foremen, are involved in your risk management workshops so they understand the background and what has to, why things have to be done. Learning from doing training, simulation, the models and uh, uh, management also have to inspire, encourage and I use this word vigorously execute I prefer. So management's role is to ensure that staff vigorously execute risk treatment proposals, risk treatment solutions. So we come back to the risk types, the project budget. So uh, uh, we've covered you know that where where the unknowns are unknowns are. I've talked with you about how you can put some money in there to test and trial models and so on. If you don't do that, you end up with these 
risks coming up here and I've put up there systemic risks are in that category. And of course with the, the Holman model you have the systemic risks and you have the project specific risks. His, his method is to have both. So typically you have the systemic risk using his parametric risk model that I showed you there and then you have about 10 major risks to define the uh, project. We've used that on uh, you know, retrospectively on some of the LX projects. So in summary, invest, invest time and energy in models and finding out and you know get the grey sneakers on and check out what's around and uh, go and speak with uh, the community and the other stakeholders and involve them. Uh, the more you do, the better you're going to come out in the end. Treatments don't have to, don't have to cost, so we had that simple uh, permeability test in the filter sand, the, the little scale models of the, of the bridge and the underslung trusses. Diverse range of stakeholders vigorously implement the treatments and hold people accountable. That's management's task. Good luck on your projects. <laughs>